Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm pleased to welcome one of the most original and popular comedians in show business today. Our guest is originally from India. In 1992, after losing her mother suddenly at the age of 14 and facing the prospect of being forced by her father into an arranged marriage, she took the courageous step of traveling to America on her own to live with family. She became a lawyer, a wife, a mother of three children, and then decided to pursue her passion for comedy. Within a very short time, she has become an award-winning screenwriter and one of the hottest stand-up comics in the business. Her hilarious hit shows, My American Dream and Sari, Not Sorry, have taken the nightclub circuit and the internet by storm. Her comedy videos on TikTok have had more than 35 million views. She is the irrepressible force of nature known as Zarna Garg. Zarna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Namaste and Shalom. Thank you so much for having me. I, it's such an honor and such a pleasure. I'm so thrilled to be, be here. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Zarna, it's often said that great comedy is born from great sadness. Was that true in your case? I, I think so. I mean, like, I didn't know this because I'm an accidental comedian, but definitely there is a comedic tendency for now I know, to turn even the darkest moments into funny stories. Like we just tend to, to spin them in a certain way and, and try to make light of it. So it's all born out of a place, place of great sadness, though. It is true. Well, I've heard you say in an interview that comedy is rooted in discomfort, but yes. teaches you to keep perspective and turn the pain into therapy. Now, we all know that it's therapeutic to laugh, but you found therapeutic value in being the one to make other people laugh, which is amazing. I mean, it's been, I've been doing it my whole life. I'm telling you, when I first hit my open mic and the first time got on stage, I looked around and I was like, this is a job? Like, white people do this? It never occurred to me that you could be paid to make people laugh. I'm so uh, glad you figured it out. Yeah, it has you, been quite a journey. You've said that you quickly learned the value of being the funny one. People were drawn to you because you made them laugh. That's a real gift, isn't it? I mean, it's I like to say that art is, is a therapy. It's a weapon if you use it wisely, you know, because it will get it will open doors that otherwise would never be open for a woman like me. Your father wanted to push you into an arranged marriage when you were just a teenager and you literally escaped India and moved to America. Zarna, what was your adjustment like to being an immigrant in America? So I was in such a state of survival mode. You know, I, I was willing to do anything just to survive. At that time, I didn't focus much on who thinks I'm an immigrant and what anybody thought of me. In hindsight, I go back to those years and think, oh, yeah, that person did insult me. And I'm like, I didn't really pay attention to it. I didn't really. Honestly, at the time, I, all, I was all about somehow baking it here and getting an education, which is something I wanted so badly. And I was afraid that the, that my family that took me in, anybody can, you know, when they're not your parents, they can pull the plug anytime. And I was extremely conscious. I mean, even your parents can, which I found out the hard way. But I was very conscious of always being amicable and like sticking to my business. So being an immigrant, the immigrant part of it didn't even hit me until many years into living in America. I was but, so grateful to be in America and to be in college that I didn't even think of. And people were largely, by and large, everybody was very welcoming. By and large, people were very welcoming. Did you have to contend with a lot of racism in America? Not, you know what, I'm telling you, there's ignorance is bliss. There were times when people said something that was probably meant to insult, but I didn't understand American slang enough. So I took everything as a compliment. I come from a place of believing that everybody loves me. So even if they were trying to say or do something mean to me, I probably didn't get it. <laughs> I don't know whether you can even appreciate that your likability 
you're such a likable person. I think it must have helped you gain acceptance as an immigrant because you could make people laugh and you were so much fun to be around. I mean, I know all this now and I'll tell you, like, please, can you say this to my mother-in-law? Because she still questions my likability. <laughs> She's like, who's telling you you're good at what you're doing? Tell them to call me for a review. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm telling you, she's single-handedly sabotaging my business by putting up a negative Yelp review every day. <laughs> I think that's the biggest compliment if your mother-in-law doesn't like you. Yeah. But I do think that there's something about just keeping it light. Like, for example, years, you know, for many years in America, I've heard immigrants are here to take your job. And I just started making jokes about it before I was ever a comedian. I would walk into a room and be like, you know, I'm here for your job. <laughs> and. <laughs> And then I would be like, what do you do? Oh, you're, in, you're a NASA scientist. Yes, I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what made you want to be a lawyer? I was a good writer always. I love to write. And if you're an Indian person, you're either a, a doctor, an engineer, or if, if you can't get into either of those two things, you're a lawyer. It never occur- Creative writing as a business is unheard of. I, I, I'm being honest with you. Like it never occurred to me that you could actually write stories and do storytelling as a profession. Well, you were a litigation attorney in Manhattan. Did you enjoy being a lawyer? I did, but I'm telling you, no one was ever scared of me. It was a problem back then. I remember my opponents would get my email and be like, we look forward to your emails. I was like, I'm telling you, I'm going to sue you. But my emails were funny. Even when I was threatening, I was not threatening. I I was not a good lawyer. First of all, I was bad at it. I'll admit it now. I would go to the judge myself and be like, he's guilty. We both know it. My own client. (laughs) (laughs) I'd be like, let's just put everybody out of their misery. Let's do this. You know, I need to go home and watch some TV. Is that why you left the practice of law? Actually, I was okay as a lawyer, but it is true that people thought my legal emails were funny, which at the time I used to be like, why is this person laughing? They should be afraid. But I did leave because I couldn't figure out a life in corporate law as a mother, as an immigrant mother with no family, no friends nearby. You know, uh, I, I honestly, I marvel at the women who are able to pull it off you know, have the kids and the job, like a, like a corporate job, you know, like 20 years ago, work from home. You, you work in your office. You had to prove every minute that you're there. You're the first one in, the last one out. And New York City, you can imagine, it was intense. So, you know, I couldn't figure it out. And I decided, you know, my very traditional. My husband had a decent job and I thought, okay, maybe this is my life story. I will support him. I will raise my family. And that's what will happen. Yeah. Well, your comedy is very much a product of your perspective as an Indian wife, mother, auntie, and an immigrant. I find it refreshing that you portray the Indian culture in a very fun way. Because until you came along, many Western films and TV shows portrayed Indian culture, I think, in a very sad way. Yeah, it's true. And honestly, that was the impetus for me to learn screenwriting, to be honest with you. So when my youngest was in kindergarten, full time in school, I knew I wanted to work, get back to work as soon as possible. It was eating at me inside that I wasn't participating in the world, you know, being with kids alone for all those years. But I knew I didn't want to go back to law. It still wouldn't work. And I was like, what can I do to make a difference in a space that's not been touched yet? And it it occurred to me that there has not been a very happy, big Indian wedding story, a rom-com. I mean, we are the wedding people. Indian people are the original wedding people. Absolutely. We have 10 day long weddings and there's not a big, happy wedding movie. I was like, why is that? So I started digging in that space. And honestly, I was very upset that the Greeks are still ruling that space and they have the biggest wedding movie. You know how many Greek people there are in this world? Maybe 25 million. That's two streets in Delhi. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I absolutely agree. I mean, you, as far as I know, you're a real pioneer. You're the first female Indian comedian, aren't you? 
I am no. There are actually there are a few female Indian comedy, very few, maybe three or four worldwide. But they don't do family comedy. They're not married. They're not. They don't have kids. So they do. It, it's there. There's a younger breed of female comedians trying to break out. And to be honest, very sadly, a lot of them have shut down their business already this year because the government in India does not support that type of freedom of expression at all. It's actually dangerous and more dangerous for women than men, as you know. So a lot of them have stopped doing comedy and have transitioned to doing other types of funny work. I, as far as I know, I'm the only one that comes up and does mother-in-law. You know, like the classic Indian. It's very close to what Jewish women have been doing for you know fifty years or more. For Italian women have been doing. It's just that Indian women have never approached this. This art form. Well, because you are so unique, I doubt that you had any role models as a stand-up comic. But are there any female comedians, past or present, who influenced your comedic style? Of course, all the famous ones. I've been watching comedy my whole life. I never realized I could be the one doing it. But I will tell you this: that my community of comedian women comedians, like working comedians, they're not Netflix famous. But they're all working comedians. They've been doing it for twenty, thirty years. They really, especially, shout out to the working Jewish comedians, the female comedians, who gave me the courage and said, "You can do this." Every time I thought, "Oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen," they stepped in and said, "Nothing's going to happen. You're going to do this. It's time. Your time has come." So without them, I don't think I would have a career. To be really honest with you, because. And because I had them and they had my back, I felt empowered. So the comedian, the working comedian community in New York has really embraced me, especially the women. And they became, you know, they became the the conduit for me to get started. I can't imagine anybody not embracing you. I mean, you are very much like a Jewish female comedian, but without the guilt. Yeah. Oh no, I have plenty of guilt. <laughs> I do make do you. you know, Listen, you can't be a parent. You cannot be a mother without having like a whole range of guilt. I just choose to make jokes out of it, like every other comedian. Of course, we do. It's, you know, of course, it's it's a big part of being a mom. I'm just so sorry that Joan Rivers isn't around because I think she would have loved you. I listen. She is the most. Even though she's not around, she's everywhere. She's the inspiration. I, you know, I, I, to be honest. I watch her interviews all the time because she talks about how you have to do it yourself. Like no one's gonna help you because there's a lot of down moments in comedy. Like every business, there are ups and downs. You know, you lose a booking or you. And I come at it from a very strong business perspective, so I don't do shows for free. I don't do a lot is expected for free, especially from a woman in this business. And I really step in, and I'm like, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But I lean on Joan Rivers' past interviews. I'll watch what she said, how she approached and built a business. So you know, I'm very grateful to her even now, and thank God for all the video films that we have. Oh, for sure. Now, Zarna, what has been the reaction to your comedy from the Indian American community? They have supported me in a way that I couldn't have even expected. It. I really? knew they would. Be, oh my God! The support from the Indian community is mind, and it's shocking to be honest. And I'm sure you may relate to it in your community. There's there's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of envy, envy generally in the community, right? Like if my son was going to be a doctor, there would be a lot of envy for sure. But somehow, happy comedy has brought everybody together. I I have women. I tell my girlfriends, I'm like, you two hate each other. Keep that hate at the door and come for my show, and they show up, you know. And we laugh. Like my first bringer show. I'm not sure you're aware what that is. That is, I'll just to inform your audience. I'll tell you, when you're a new comedian and you're looking for stage time at a club, you're required to bring people usually because they have they're a club. They have to sell alcohol and their food and whatever. So I was told that if I brought five people, I would get five minutes. And you know, most comedians struggle with bringing five people over and over because you know they run out of people. How many times are people going to come? I put one flyer out to my old Instagram page that wasn't even a business page. I think I had a hundred followers. 
I put one flyer out and 90 people showed up. Oh, wow. From all over the tri-state area. And I couldn't believe it. People were just like rolling in and they're like, oh, we, we saw your flyer. I go, you did? How many people saw this flyer? And, I, and it occurred to me that because no one had ever done it before, this became so exciting in the community. They were like, she's going to make fun of her mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and did you get 90 minutes? No, no, I got five minutes. But you know what? People went out, they tweeted, they texted, they like, you know, the way things go viral. And there was no looking back. Like after that, I was inundated from clubs. I was inundated from my community. They were like, do a show here, do a show there. And I had to hurry up and write as much comedy as I could quickly so I could keep up with the, with the demand. It's amazing. You know, you wrote a screenplay entitled Rearranged, which is based on your own life story. Your script beat out 11,000 other scripts to win the Best Comedy Screenplay Award at the Austin Film Festival in 2019. I think that is amazing, Zarna. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was quite a moment. And I'll tell you that moment, this is a little controversial, but I'm going to put it out there. That moment would not have happened in India for me, ever. This is a testament to America, this is a testament to how the system works here. I mean, the screenplay is submitted in black and white on a piece of paper with no names, nothing. No one knows. I'm competing with past Oscar winners because they're still submitting their recent works, you know, whatever they were. The fact that people could just read a story and make a decision on the, on the merits of it, that to me is what I came here for. I mean, it was an, un I really didn't, I wasn't, when I was a finalist in the top five, I was like, I'm not going to go for this event. I don't know anybody there, you know? And then the film festival organizers called me and said, you should come. And, you know, I said, okay, I'll go. I'll sit in a corner by myself. It's fine. But that moment when my name was announced, I couldn't believe that people read the story and connected with it. It's a true American success story. And I'm so honored. Like, I can't even tell you. I don't think you realize how really good you are. I, I, I don't spend any time thinking about how good I am. I spend time thinking about how better I can get. Well, and I think that's fabulous. But the fact that you won is so validating. And I, I can't wait for this screenplay to be made into a movie or maybe a TV series. Yeah, we're working on it. We're definitely working on it. I understand that you were inspired by Kevin Hart's book, I Can't Make This Up, Life Lessons. What was it about his story that resonated with you so deeply? So in his book, he talks about his own childhood and how, you know, he was raised largely by a single, by not a single mother because he had a father and it was a difficult relationship. But he talks about how him and his mother were often invited to places because he was funny. And that was a moment where I was like, that's me. I remember being out of, you know, I was out by myself at 15 when I left my, my dad's house. And I remember thinking, where am I going to go? But everywhere doors opened because they were like, oh, yeah, call her. She'll, make, she'll keep dinner light. You know, I had nothing to offer anybody except the ability to make them laugh. And that portion of his book, was the first time that I was like, oh my God, is this how comedians possibly start? And I started digging more into what leads a person into becoming a comedian. Very, right. and, and the funny thing is that his story was rooted in a lot of poverty in America. Mine was rooted in affluence. I, I, I was born into a wealthy family in India, but I found creative ways to lose it all because my dad literally wrote me out of everything once I left. But even in uh, whether that was another observation that affluence or, or not, comedy cuts through every barrier. Everybody wants to laugh. I think that's really true. And I think likability actually beats out competence in many areas simply because people want to be around someone whose company they enjoy. But, you know, the thing about you, you learned how to use comedy both for therapy for yourself, also to make yourself likable and popular. 
but it takes a certain amount of guts to get up on a stage in front of an audience and make people laugh. It's not like sitting at the dinner table. When you get in front of that microphone and you've never looked back, audiences fell in love with you everywhere and immediately. You must have been surprised to see how quickly you became so successful. I, uh, yes, I didn't expect this, you know, this trajectory for sure. But honestly, I decided early into my comedy, stand-up comedy career, that the only way to take the fear out was to treat every show like a big dinner party. Really? So if I'm, if you're Indian, like a few hundred people is like a normal small size wedding to us. I'm, we're around people that size all the time. And I've been, I'm a mom, you know, I've been throwing dinner parties, parent meetings, this and that. I was like, this is no different. To me, it's no different. It's the same people. The audience is full of human beings that are parents, you know, neighbors and all of it. So I take, I try my best to take the stress out of it by reminding myself that I've been doing this for 20 years, even though I'm only two years on stage. And you write all your own material, right? Absolutely. So I get you... a lot of help. I get a lot of help because to take even an A joke to an A plus level, you do need skill. It's, it's, it's a particular level of skill. So I invest a lot in coaching, learning classes. I'm even right now, I'm enrolled in multiple comedy writing classes all the time because I want to get better and better. Do you ever suffer from stage fright? I do, but it's rare. And I, I really have to get over it. Like I, ha you know, I don't allow myself the luxury of overthinking it because I know it's going to ruin the moment. You know, comedy works best light and happy. And if you're overthinking, like I don't, there's also like a deep spiritual part of me that believes that a bigger hand than me guided me to the spot. So I have a lot of faith that I'm protected. I so believe that, Zarna. I, I, I feel it myself just talking to you. Absolutely. And another thing that amazes me about you, you've become hugely successful on the internet with over 35 million views on TikTok. And what's amazing about that is that TikTok caters almost exclusively to teenagers. And here you are in your mid 40s taking TikTok by storm. It's unheard of. How did you make that happen? So, you know, not to flex, but we just crossed 55 million views. And that's the speed at which TikTok grows now. I, my son got me on TikTok, my 15 year old. He, you know, the world shut down. I couldn't believe that after all the work that I had done, all the momentum that I had, every club in New York City closed. One day I had to sit and refund thousands of people because tickets had been sold for, you know, uh, and and you, you, you can imagine how painful, like it was so hard to get started that I couldn't believe. But I was sitting there and my son said, you know, I'm starting to see comedians on TikTok. And I was like, what am I going to do? You know, they're probably young comedians, like talking to the younger demographic. I, what am I going to be there? And he's like, no, mom, I think you should put some of your jokes up. And I, I disregarded him. And he took my tape and just edited a few bits and put them up there. And within a day, we, we had a million views on one of my jokes. The, the joke about I don't say I love you to my husband. I remember that. And, you know, thousands of people were like, neither do we. We don't say I love you either. It was a revelation. And then that took off its own journey. And I started treating TikTok more like a stand-up comedy show. You know, people are relating. What does it matter whether we're in a club or here or there? It's all the same emotions. And then the more I put out there, the more, even the kids, to be honest with you, what I have found is that the young community actually wants to be with their family. They, there is a desire to be doing multi-generational viewing as the business calls it, but they're not enough products that appeal broadly. So because I make so many jokes about my teenage son, my teenage daughter, it kind of brought that community into the fold. And then they started relating to the mother-in-law stuff because they all have grandparents. They have, you know. So then I started designing and structuring every bit, slightly shaping it in a way that a young person would find, find it appealing. And the more I went down that road, the more that account grew. It's actually 
astonishing that your career actually took off even more during the pandemic because of the Zoom shows you've done. You know, the comedy club shut down and you you took off. But you know what? I I think that there is a silver lining in everything, right? I knew from the outset that the comedy club culture will not really back me up. I, I knew that from day one. The way clubs are designed, they're not designed to support a woman like me. It, it really, because I don't like to push the alcohol. I'll be honest with you. I'm a mother. I don't want to encourage anybody to have that fourth drink. Don't drink. As far as I'm considered, don't drink at all. Drink water. I know that the comedy clubs, they like the young, hot, new thing. So from the very beginning, I've been very focused on finding my own audience. I knew that the only way the clubs will take me is if I say to them, I will sell the tickets and you will see that I have an audience, but they will not help me. So what happened is that even when the club shut down, I didn't really lose much if you think about it, because it's not like they were backing me to begin with. I was like, okay, I'm just going to transition to a different platform to finding an audience. And I started doing a lot of community work. I was, I'm in New York City. We were the epicenter of the epicenter for a long time. So I started doing shows out in the parks because I was like, you know what? If I can bring joy to five people, I'm putting my time to use. During that time, do you remember that time when we were the epicenter? We weren't sure. They were like mobile uh, morgues two streets down from me. So I was like, what do we have to lose? We're all dying, people. Let me tell the jokes. (laughs) <laughs> it's amazing. I just, I'm telling you, I want to be your new best friend. We already are. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you about Hollywood. Now that you've conquered the comedy club circuit and you've conquered the internet, have Hollywood managers, agents, producers come knocking on your door? Uh, they have now. When I won Austin, no one wanted to talk to me. That was the first thing. I'll tell you, you think you win this big thing and Austin is the writer's <laughs> festival. So you would think, They didn't know what to make of me. Honestly, they were like, okay, she's a mom. It's a one-time thing. She wrote one screenplay. But I have been so determined that I'm going to be part of this and that my women, my community will be heard. And we will, we want to be a part of this world. And happily, we have no criticism for anybody. We want to bring our joyful stories. So I just disregard every, and the more I focused on being who I am, the more industry started getting involved. Like now major casting agents and directors have found me on TikTok because they know I'm not out there trying to chase them. I'm chasing my community and our work. I hope you understand that your community is even bigger than you may realize. It's not just women, it's gay men, it's people from every ethnicity, from every socioeconomic group, because the things that you make jokes about are so universal. You make us realize that we're much more alike than we are different. Absolutely. That is the whole point of it. And I do realize, and I'm telling you, if you think, I mean, these demographics are the ones you see here, but think about the brown women who are in really orthodox countries, like countries where They couldn't even dream of getting on a stage. They're relating to me because they're watching me on social media. They're very silent. They can't even openly accept and and tell people that they watch me and they laugh, but they laugh behind closed doors. So I have a real mission to represent all of them. And you do it beautifully. And I'm going to make you a prediction right now. I think it's only a matter of time before you get your own TV show and you start headlining in Las Vegas and you become a movie star. I really think it's going to happen because you're so unique and you're hilariously funny. You're, you're very kind. And I'm so grateful that people find me funny. I hope they all email my mother-in-law so she can stop posting negative Yelp reviews. <laughs> you give me her email address and I'll take care of her. Let me tell you. Yeah. And you know, it's really quite incredible how quickly you've become so successful. Your screenplay won Best Comedy in 2019. You won the Ladies of Laughter 2021 Newcomer Award. You've been included in the list of New York City's top 100 inspiring small businesses. You're a featured comic on Kevin Hart's Lyft comic series. 
and you performed at the Outstanding Mothers Awards. Have you taken a moment to step back and really appreciate how remarkable you are, not just as an entertainer, but as a businesswoman? So I, I, all of this is amazing and I'm grateful, but I'm just a grateful person in general. If you see where my life was and where I've come from, all of this is like little cherries on top. The fact that I was able to get my education, the fact that I was able to marry a man that I loved, even though he's on probation every now and again, <laughs> we have a real marriage. The fact that I, you know, I gave birth to two sons. <laughs> or yes. I'm so filled with gratitude. My, my cup has been filled over for like, years now and all of this is just cherries on top honestly i don't spend any time thinking i'm saying thank you to the universe every day anyway and and i focus a lot on what's ahead but i do treat it like a business i will say this that i have learned that in order for women to have any hope of equality financial equality is a big part of it and we need to be treated like equals i'm you know not we don't need any favored status and that's a big part of why I treat it like a business. And, and, you know, when the most inspiring small business thing came around, I think that that's what they noticed. That many comedians treat themselves as artists and, and therefore will, will have a loosely structured business setup. I'm a business. I'm a comedy business. And, and I want to be and I want to be unapologetic about it because too many women apologize for asking to get paid. And that's not helping anybody. That's not helping the men either, by the way, because then they, there's so much resentment that it just grows and grows. I think it's better to be upfront and see, this is what I do. This is how much money I charge. And then we see where it goes. Oh, absolutely. It is a, it is a career. And I know your husband and your children are loving your newfound fame, but I have to ask you, Zarna, did your father ever reconcile with you and take pride in what you've achieved? He passed away uh, over a decade ago mm -hmm. and he never spoke to me after I left the house. So, uh, you, you know, I know in America, this seems so harsh. Like, how can a parent do that? Because in America, a parent is supposed to love their child and everything is for your children. It's just not the case in our culture and in many other cultures. I'm not alone. In some cultures, if you disrespect your father, that's the end of your life there. That's it. There's no further discussion. My father never got over the fact that I, you know, I defied him. And uh, he would be horrified. I'm, I, I'm being honest with you. He would be horrified by what I'm doing right now. He, he was an Indian man rooted in Indian beliefs. And no Indian man is standing around thinking, I wish my wife or my daughter or my girlfriend or whoever is up on stage making fun of me. It, it, it's his loss. I asked you that because when I told my parents I was gay when I was 19, they threw me out oh and I didn't see them for five years. And then we eventually did reconcile when I became a lawyer and then I became a judge. So I did have the benefit of that reconciliation and the chance to heal. And that's why I asked you. No, I understand. I, I do wish that there was some sort of follow up. Even my mom, my mom never saw anything in my life. But, you know, I have to believe that they're watching from wherever they are. And I'm hoping that I'm making them proud. I you know, know they I'm, are. I, I know, know they're watching and I know that you're making them proud. But I'm so happy that you got that reconciliation. I understand the pain of not having it. So I'm so happy that you got it and that your parents came around. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I want to say to all our viewers that you can follow Zarna's career on her website, zarnagarg.com. And of course, she's on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Well, Zarna, I absolutely love your comedy. I foresee a brilliant future for you. Thank you so much for coming on our show. And please come back anytime. Absolutely. Anytime. I'll be back. Thank you so much for having me. This has been hilarious. And I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our guest has been comedian and stand-up comic Zarna Garg. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel.
And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.